name is Harriet Anderson with the League of Women Voters of Johnson County. Welcome to Let's Talk Issues, a public service program co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Johnson County, the Johnson County Community College, and the Midwest Democracy Project of the Kansas City Star. Tonight's topic is Johnson County Environmental Changes and Challenges. Here to introduce tonight's panelist is Jim Sullinger. Thank you for joining us, and now let's talk issues. You know, the environment uh, uh, affects us all. It's the air we breathe, it's the water we drink, and the water we play in. But it's also the ground we walk on as well. So I want to take a look at, at how far we've come in terms of, of cleaning up our environment and with a special emphasis on Johnson County where we live. Uh, there are environmental challenges in Johnson County and I want to talk a little bit about those. Before we get into to more local topics, I, I want to explore a little bit uh, just for a minute on, on the national scene. Uh, what ha what uh, how has as the federal government affected uh, the environment in terms of its regulations, policies, uh, uh, what impact has the federal government had at this point in, in cleaning up our environment and, and especially uh, what we have to live with and, and abide by here in Johnson County? Uh, Betsy, uh, you are the, uh, the Pollution Control Director for the Johnson County Environmental Department. Uh, you obviously have to be pretty much aware of what the, the federal regulations are regarding uh, air and, and uh, water quality. Uh, what do you see from the federal government? How has that impacted us uh, here in Johnson County and, and really across the nation? Well, what the Federal Involvement Environmental Protection, which goes way back, it goes back to the early 1900s with, with the first attempts to, to try to regulate water pollution and um, all through today. And what it has provided was is providing a more uniform approach nationwide to controlling pollution and cleaning up our waterways and hazardous waste sites and all that kind of thing and cleaning up our air rather than a state-by-state -state approach. Um, the most recent major change like in solid waste was in the early 90s when EPA wound up pre previously the states were pretty much left to their own to manage solid waste and landfills and by that time lots of landfills were leaking and other environmental issues associated with them and then the feds stepped in and said nope we're going to come up with a, we're going to re revise what's called Subtitle D of the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act to provide uniform standards nationwide. And mm -hmm. that's, that's been a real value to, to environment, federal regulations. And I mean, I've been in the environmental profession for 34 years now. So I've seen a lot of changes in that time period. And are we better off today than then? Absolutely. That was my next question. Oh, absolutely. Is our air and absolutely. water cleaner today than it was 30 years absolutely. ago? Absolutely, yeah. Does it need to get cleaner? Yes. But is it cleaner, way cleaner? Yes, it is, absolutely. It's the environmental protection regulations in the United States are, are a huge success store, story and stands out throughout the entire world mm -hmm. as far as our ability to clean up our problems in the past to, to the point that there's a lot more emphasis now on pollution prevention mm -hmm. and voluntary pollution prevention and not totally just coming down with regulatory mm -hmm. uh, approach to life. But, and you've got a, a different attitude in the uh, industrial sector for, for doing voluntary compliance mm -hmm. and reducing our impact on the environment. Yeah, Elaine uh, Giesel is a member of the Sierra Club and the League of Women Voters of Johnson County. I am. And how long have you been an environmental activist, Elaine? Well, probably since I was a child, but I've been officially a member of Sierra Club for 30 years. Okay, all right. Do you see that we're better off today than I think we in, were in 30 most, years ago? In most arenas, we probably are. I grew up Have in we Houston. done enough? No. Growing up in Houston, Texas, certainly I can say that the passage of the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Drinking Water Protection, the National Environmental Policy Act have all led to some improvements overall. There's no doubt about it. The Houston Ship Channel had nothing alive in it when I was growing up there. And it has been proved. I've worked with the chemical industry and there certainly have been improvements there as well. There are some areas, um, perhaps because of more vehicular traffic and so on, where we're seeing smog, ozone issues that are worse in some areas. They have improved in others. Mm -hmm. I think the LA Basin is probably better now than it mm -hmm. was before, but I think in some areas with rapid growth and 
failure to implement some controls, we may see some areas that are worse. But overall, I think, as Betsy does, that there have been improvements. Over the 30-year span, uh, gauge for me the level of environmental activism that you've seen over that period of time. Uh, where are we today versus where we were uh, 30 years ago, let's say, or even 20 years ago? Well, I think that varies according to the group, and it varies on who is in power in Washington at, at the time. But there are some groups, grassroots groups like Sierra Club, whose numbers have increased during periods of time mm -hmm. when there were environmental problems and an administration that was not listening to those problems. Numbers drop when things look better. I mean, it's, it is something we do voluntarily. There are organizations that, that go out and you know, sit in trees to prevent forests from being cut. There, there's a great range. Mm -hmm. There is, I think, a movement in the environmental arena, though, towards using more science, better science, rational argument for policy changes. Mm -hmm. So Sierra Club works very closely with policymakers, congressmen, trying to affect changes at the federal level, at the regulatory level. Now, President Obama came into office mm -hmm. Uh, and, and he's been a, a big proponent of uh, alternative energy sources, uh, renewable energy. Uh, I think he's uh, pushing, for example, uh, not just wind and solar, but I think he's also pushing natural gas, too, as uh, a way to, to decrease the dependency on uh, foreign oil. Uh, how would you sum up, as an environmental activist, how would you sum up uh, President Obama's record on uh, in the environment at this point in time? I don't think he has a very clear record right now on the environment at this time, um, to be quite honest. Uh, there has been support for some new regulations. In fact, there was an editorial by Carl Brooks of EPA in the paper today, in the Star, about some new proposed regs to put tougher limits on coal-fired plant emissions that would include mercury, and mercury is a bad one, arsenic, chromium, nickel, mm. and some of the acid gases. Certainly there are some things coming now out of the administration through EPA for changes that are important. But I will say, the, you know, Obama was elected and had the support of the environmentalists because of, of his position on many different issues. We did not necessarily agree with his position on clean coal, which we don't believe will ever be clean, or a building of new nuclear facilities, or in fact um, natural gas if it is not collected in a sustainable way. The reason natural gas has come to the forefront is because of hydraulic fracturing of subsurface shales, say, isn't, and there isn't are there environmental a, impacts. Yeah, but isn't there a, a gigantic abundance of natural, I, I've, been he, I've been hearing that we have enough natural gas for like the next 200 years or something, I mean, it was in a phenomenal length, length of time for that energy source. Well, ha using our domestic sources would certainly free us from the importation of foreign fuels, fossil mm -hmm. fuels, but it is still a fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. We're still emitting CO2 at levels which are not sustainable in terms of climate change issues. It is less mm -hmm. than coal. It is not as dirty as coal. But nonetheless, there are environmental impacts and threats to groundwater mm -hmm. quality, drinking water. Mm -hmm. Those need to be addressed right away before we put all of our our eggs in that one basket. David Anderson is uh, mayor of DeSoto. And uh, David, what kind of progress uh, environmentally is being made at the local level? Mm -hmm. um, and, and how much, uh, it, uh, what are your concerns, what are your uh, victories uh, in regard to uh, what's happening on the local level? I think uh, uh, Betsy said it earlier when you were talking about the, the environmental movement and how it's affected all of us nationally and locally. I can give you a great example. The, the city of DeSoto, uh, before I moved there, but uh, used to just use the ravines close to the river for a dump. Yes. And, uh, and a couple of years ago, we uh, partnered with uh, um, the state of Kansas and, and got a uh, phase one done and then a phase two, and we cleaned up part of the river and put in a boat ramp. Um, the 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 thing that's happened. I I was in high. I was a freshman in high school when Earth Day, the first Earth Day, came around. So I think it's a it's widespread um, impact has been people just wanting to have their environment cleaner mm -hmm. uh, and do what they can do. So uh, you know, a long time ago, DeSoto picked up its trash and started solid waste management mm -hmm. through trash collection instead of just dumping it at the river. Mm -hmm. 
Have you seen more environmental consciousness among the citizens that you interact with? Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Are we as a public more environmentally conscious about what we do? Now, uh, I can tell you right now that uh, I just fertilized my yard, and I'm sure a lot of that fertilizer has gone <coughs> into, you know, a certain amount of it is going to run off uh, into the uh, storm collection system, and then ultimately will get to the river. But, uh, but you know, I'm still going to be putting fertilizer on my lawn because I want a good lawn. It's Johnson County. Well, I, uh, I, I've, I've got a DeSoto solution for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just built a new house two years ago, and a large lot of our lots are on acreage, and so they're not sewerable, they're septic. And <clears throat> the septic systems have had faulty problems, in not inspected, not properly installed. Um, the community <clears throat> wants to expand in those areas. People want to come out and have a large lot. Um, my septic system has a, a, a grinder pump in the first tank, goes to a second tank that holds, and then is pumped up into my yard. So I oh, so am fertilizing my own yard. Without having to go to the grass <laughs> That's pad correct. or and, the Home Depot to get your fertilizer. And after, after the aeration process, and uh, it is... <laughs> tested to be 95% in the state of Wisconsin and the state of New York, a lot of septic systems, uh, they would allow that discharge on the ground <coughs> because it's that clean. And, and if you wanted to uh, put an ultraviolet there, you'd get rid of the rest yeah. of the bugs. But, we, but that is something that the community has asked for in DeSoto to upgrade our regulations for septic. And the uh, Johnson County government has been very active in, uh, in conservation, uh, in uh, b requirements for new buildings, uh, new public buildings that it builds. Uh, there's uh, standards for using recyclable materials. Uh, there's the uh, LEED uh, uh, certifications yeah, the that county, the county has county, been able to yeah, get. Definitely the county, is the county is working toward all new, new construction is to be LEED certified at, at the different levels. and. Uh, the, the first building was a Sunset Office building, 119th and Ridgeview, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a quite a change in how we approach building things at the time, and it has proved itself right and left on energy savings, water conservation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful building with a beautiful setting, and so that's that's now the standard. Mm -hmm. So you know it, it, you know, at one time people s thought environmental regulations and conserving resources is a waste of money, and yet in reality you're saving money. If you're not wasting water, you're saving dollars, mm -hmm. and you happen to be doing both, uh, which is great. Jim, I'm, I, uh, that's not a full-time job being mayor, but I, I'm a constructor, uh, and I back up what Betsy said. Architects and owners are now looking on their own as to which way the building faces and how much glass do I have and mm -hmm. what kind of you know toilets am I going to put in there and they're, they're doing it without LEED certification. LEED certification is a standard right. and, and I, th I don't know if you can get money for that or, or you know, uh, yeah, but, the, but they are already doing it mm. without actually having to do the LEED standard. Yeah. They're really thinking about it. Well, and a lot of the materials that are being used right. now are so much better. Uh, I even remember when, uh, when you built a school, for example, years ago, uh, you pretty much enclosed the thing without very many windows. Right. Uh, and, and the windows might yeah. be just a little <laughs> slit on the side. Uh, and the idea was to keep the uh, control, better control of the heat and the, and the if it was air conditioned, well, and those had to be air conditioned. Yeah, those had to be, right. yeah. Uh, and keep the students could, from daydreaming. That you could hold <laughs> down the cost of the utilities because uh, the heat and the cool would not be lost through windows. Uh, Olathe just opened a new school, a new uh, a middle school, in the western west part of the uh, of the city, mm -hmm. and uh, I went out to see it not long ago, and I was amazed at the amount of windows that it had. It was, but but then those are energy efficient windows, That's right. yeah. and so there's no, so the building materials have, mm -hmm. have even changed. Yeah, we've kept moving forward, and we're not going backwards. Yeah. And that's the important. That's so important to keep moving forward with the new innovations and mm -hmm. being acceptable. It's acceptable now. In in housing developments, though, not in government buildings, um, mm -hmm. maybe not in the school system, we do need to see a little more emphasis on building houses efficiently. And I know that Mid America Regional Council, Mark, is mm -hmm. trying to work with the various municipalities, with Johnson County, 
in getting them to adopt international energy efficiency standards. There are codes out there. Right. They have to be right. brought in as ordinances yes. at city level. And we need to see that happen so that it isn't just a leadership that the county is showing on its own buildings, but that we see this across the board in all the new homes they're built in Johnson County. I think one other thing on, on that, Elaine, is not, yes, the homes, <coughs> but but I see is a big problem in transportation, p air pollution, the sprawl that we sure. have uh, is it's going to get, uh, there's a sustainability factor there in design, pl planning design, right. not just construction. Exactly. Uh, you know, we need more density, they need to be transportation located. These are all things that our county, which is a, a step above many, needs to start thinking about because mm -hmm. to keep on building on uh, is not making a whole, we have more lane miles per capita in this city than anywhere in the country. Yeah. I'm but, aware of that. How does that but work? That's, you know, but you're going to, to bump, up, bump up against, mm -hmm. you know, developers who want to make money and, you know, environmental concerns of, of people like Elaine, uh, other people that have been concerned about sprawl. Mark attempted to handle this sprawl issue not long ago and, uh, uh, and it, it kind of got shot down. Johnson County didn't want it, hardly any part of it mm -hmm. because they wanted to, to really limit to some degree uh, the growth, uh, development. Well, it, and, it and, takes and development has been the, the, um, the gold standard of Johnson County for years and years and years. And you get quite a pushback from, uh, from the real estate industry and the construction industry when you t start talking about limiting sprawl and 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 yes but maybe this little downturn which has wrung out the construction development all of those phases maybe we can take a chance right now as a county and as cities to start ta talking about different kinds of right. development it doesn't take the developer out right. puts them back in it actually moves them that direction right. instead of that direction well when you have only 300 houses built in Olathe in a year you can imagine that uh, the the uh, economic situation has pretty well put a halt on sprawl at right. this point in time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, we've talked a, lo a lot of, uh, so far on the successes. Um, we've talked about building standards and uh, and and uh, pollution controls and and uh, how our water is cleaner and our air is cleaner. But you know, every now and again, especially during the summertime, Betsy, we get ozone alerts. <laughs> What's that all about? Uh, what, what, why do we have ozone alerts? <laughs> well, there's this a lot of people and a lot of cars and, uh, and hot summers. The ozone that's a, of concern in the summer is what's called ground level ozone, and that's the ozone that's formed from the interaction of organic compounds in the atmosphere, primarily from in, uh, combustion of fossil fuels, uh, the big sources, what cars. What comes out of the tailpipe of yeah, my car. What comes out there, interacting in the atmosphere with sunlight and heat, that's, you have to have heat, that's why you don't have ozone formation in the winter. Mm -hmm. And with that, you form ozone, which is smog, which is uh, extremely unhealthy. Anybody with any kind of lung impairment, uh, the elderly, young children, mm -hmm. anybody that's very, very susceptible, it's, it's not good, it's very unhealthy. And that's what the ozone alert's about. And that's, that also the fact that we have ozone alerts, uh, not, we, didn't, we didn't have ozone alerts 30 years ago and ozone right. smog was far worse. But it's a huge public awareness that we have now, and through that's through Mid America Regional Council uh, that we do the ozone alerts, and it's it's calculated out, predicted mm -hmm. the day before based on the modeling of the projected what the weather's going to be the next day, mm -hmm. and then to forewarn people so that we as individuals can take action, because mm -hmm. so much nowadays is about individual participation in helping keep the environment in better shape. You know, for so long, like for me, I started in the environmental regulatory realm as, you know, I'm, I'm going to make you do, do, do these things. You know, and every time we point our fingers at that, we got to remember there's three more pointing back at us. And <laughs> so we've gone from, you know, industry and manufacturing environment, all those environments that had to uh, have really worked really well since the uh, formation of the uh, of EPA back in 1970 to clean up their emissions, air and water, solid waste, hazardous waste. And now we're in a, a whole new phase now where us as individuals are a big part of the problem and, and we can take action. And even though we may not think our, our little action, putting our plastic bottle in the recycling thing isn't a big deal, but you multiply that by the, our population, it's huge. Mm 
-hmm. And so we as individuals are, are having to take a greater responsibility and, and like any kind of life, community life, family life, school life, when individuals can take responsibility for themselves, we're, we're mm -hmm. much better off. I always thought the ozone was getting worse than it was 30 years ago because uh, we didn't have the ozone alerts 30 years ago. <laughs> and now we started <laughs> having them. I'm thinking, well, gosh, why don't we go back to the good old days when we didn't yeah. have that? <laughs> uh, back but when what you're saying was it was worth, worse 30 oh, years ago oh, than certainly. it is today. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Is it because the uh, uh, cars, uh, the Oh, the emissions from cars emissions reduced dramatically. are better on the cars? Yeah, well, there are controls. <laughs> yeah, they, that's true. Yeah. And then, you know, when we all get electric cars, then the problem will go away. Well, it doesn't totally go away, because where does electricity come from? Oh, Coal-fired okay. plants. <laughs> <laughs> so we and we're go, building one. We could yeah. go into we're that building if we'd like. So it's not totally eliminating the problem, but it's definitely controlling it. So instead yeah. of having all those tailpipes generating pollution, you have single pipes yeah. at the coal what plants. Are, what, are, what are other... Uh, uh, what are other major challenges besides ozone, obviously? What, uh, what major challenges is this area facing? Uh, sprawl certainly is one area. Uh, uh, any others that, uh, that you all see on the, on the horizon that needs to be, uh, to be addressed a little more? Well, uh, with sprawl, I, I think maybe a link, uh, public transportation. Uh, uh, the new, new chair of the county, uh, Ed Ireland, had, uh, I don't know if anybody went to his state of the county address and did the clicker. Um, were you there? The no, survey. I did not go. The survey? <coughs> did, were you there? No, Ellie? I did not. I was not well, I, don't, I won't have the exact numbers, but the, you know, he had a list of 10 things and it included parks and public education, public safety, and you know, one was public transportation. And, and you voted for, what do you think, if, if something had to be cut or, or, or lessened, you know, what would you pay for? And, you know, transportation didn't hit it. Uh, and then they said something about transportation in a more positive fashion. You think it's a good thing? Do you think we need more rapid transit and that? Man, that thing's right at the top. Hmm. Next question. How many of you, okay, how many of us have taken <laughs> Johnson County Public Transportation? And that's the same response. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it has a lot to do with the sprawl, but it also has a lot to do with the, our mentality of I got to get go where I got to go, mm -hmm. and, and and that's a bigger equation, and we just have to try to solve it. Um, and if I might, for just a second, go a little bit further, we have an employer that built in a, an, ex, in an expansion in Desoto. That's wonderful. He has great paying jobs, but Desoto has uh, a housing shortage, affordable housing shortage, and these people have to drive to get there. Right. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what if their car breaks down? Well, this person's making $18 an hour, not bad, but then there's an extra expense. He was interested in public transportation yeah. or, or affordable, sustainable housing. And with the uh, rising uh, price of gasoline, <laughs> that's even becoming even more. more right. Uh, so if uh, he misses expensive. a day of work, he, that really hurts. Yeah. So public transportation, I think, is a big problem. I know yeah. that the um, KDOT is working on a five-county regional transportation plan. I've sat on that committee mm -hmm. for a couple of years now, and prioritizing what areas need to be addressed is part of our process. We're going to now start prioritizing. And, and one of the first things said was it wouldn't be just about building new roads. It has to be about alternative transportation yes. methods that are timely, efficient, safe, and enough of them that you can get where you want to go in a timely fashion. Because it's, it's it expensive difficult. to build a road it, it and is. it's and it is doesn't go away there. It costs yeah. the cities to maintain them or the mm -hmm. you know the states and the other uh, county and federal agencies but I gotta plow them, I gotta patch them, we gotta replace them I and mean, they wear out so you're just putting more energy back into the same old road mm -hmm. and, right. and unless you start the planning side where you have transportation node development, density, Walkability. Right. To remember the old neighborhood school. You got to. You got to. We got to start thinking a little bit different. Well, and, and with that too, this is all related to human population growth, and how do you manage that growth in an orderly manner? So you you might get away from the sprawl, but at the same time, it is about development, and how much development should a community in a county, in our case, within each cities of the county, how much development versus how much is land is set aside. You know, the Johnson County Park System is a extremely popular park system. Yes. The Streamway Parkways, which were born out of all the floods mm -hmm. there in the late 70s and early 80s, are, I, I've, I've seen the numbers, it's, it's huge the number of people that use those Streamway Parkways. And mm -hmm. so it's not just about uh, 
making sure there's a house for everybody, but there's the other amenities that are becoming more and more important as we lose more and more green space is how that's available to us mm -hmm. and the, the quality of that mm -hmm. and that the, and uh, how, literally is how much green space needs to be set aside. I mean, we got uh, the example of the Heron Rookery right. out at near Shawnee Mission Park and how much value is that from people like most people, it's very high. Uh, and yet if you're a developer, do you go in there and tear all that down to build a bunch of houses? So you have to go in a plan management so that you know that you can protect protect areas so we still sustain the natural environment mm -hmm. with balancing it with the human population growth. And if you talk to uh, Johnson County Park officials, they will tell you that we are, are, are behind other uh, areas like ours in reserving that green space uh, and having enough mm -hmm. um, That's true. for our citizens. Uh, we're, we are behind in that. Um, you know, Jim, I would be remiss. You asked about problems that we have to face, and we've been talking about short-term local problems. And I, I would remind you, the Sierra Club has been working on issues like the global climate change, in, in also in how it affects us locally. And there are some issues that we will have to start looking at very seriously in terms of fresh water availability throughout the state of Kansas. What will happen if the models are correct and the, the High Plains area, Kansas area, becomes hotter and drier? What impact will that have on food growing on the basis of our, our agricultural community in Kansas? Our, our animal feedlots um, will be pressed. But also in our urban center like Kansas City, we're going to see enough heating probably to impact the public health there. Probably more deaths due to heat factors when it doesn't cool down at night. And those are long range. It's a lot harder to say we need to be addressing this as well, but we, we can't let those slip off the table right now. It's you know, part there of are, our life. There are concerns about the, the quality of air, water, and, and whatnot. Uh, and I think generally it's accepted uh, that we need to do more on conservation. Uh, I think, it, 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 do, you, do you see uh, more emphasis by the public on conservation today than, than say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago? I think Are it's you become, seeing more uh, well, efforts by people to conserve? I think it's become more widespread, more, more common that, of course, that's what we're doing. Of course, that's important. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most people recognize that, but uh, global warming is, I think, a tougher sell. It's, it's a harder thing a to get your arms sell. around. A lot tougher sell, especially when you run across a summer like uh, a year or two ago when mm -hmm. we had a uh, unseasonably cool summer. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have to realize that global warming is not about the weather. Weather. <laughs> right. It's about the long-term climate. Right. And, you know, the climate that we're living in today has only been around 10, 12,000 years. Prior to that, the climate was up and down and was not a happy place right. to be living. So we've been living the good life as a human population. In that time period, our population has exploded to every niche of the, of the world. And can that change? That can change naturally because that's mm -hmm. the natural course of things. Nothing yeah. is static on this earth. Yeah. And is it human induced? And the arguments can continue, but you have to remember why do we have an atmosphere? Why do we have life on earth? No matter what your feeling of how life got here is to recognize how life is sustained here. And without that big weather machine, or the climate that making up our climate, um, we're not going to exist. And whether and and there's no question that with the fossil fuel consumption since the late 1800s to today, mm -hmm. we have taken all the carbon that was secluded underground, mm -hmm. that uh, was busily being formed into oil, natural gas, and coal. That the Earth grew up over the billions of years with a cycling of that carbon dioxide as it is today, and then the last 150 years, we've exploded the amount that's up there. The carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a very, very tiny percent of the atmosphere because it's continuously going through there. Because what is carbon dioxide used for? You know, green plants. Yeah, plants. Uh, green plants, take it, green plants they taken, in. they take in carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. And they take in carbon dioxide, water, and with the sunlight, through the process of photosynthesis in green plants, those are those mm -hmm. carbon dioxide and water molecules are literally split apart, reconfigured into something called sugar, glucose, which is transports, takes sunlight, the primary form of energy that's fueling life on Earth, not the only source, but the primary source, fueling life on Earth is that sugar is being formed by carbon dioxide, this gas in the atmosphere, water, is becoming organic sugar. 
and then we as animals, and a byproduct from the plants is oxygen. Mm -hmm. That's a waste product. They're kind of spitting mm -hmm. it out yeah, there. They don't need it. That excess oxygen molecule. We as animals need that. So then we as mm -hmm. animals eat a plant. Okay, that plant is made up of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. Where did that come from? Carbon dioxide and water. Mm -hmm. And so we as animals consume, we digest that food. What's our byproduct? We're breathing out carbon dioxide. Plants are breathing in carbon dioxide. This whole incredibly wonderful cycle of how life is sustained on Earth. And without this, the solid atmosphere we have with the upper layer ozone, which blocks the horrible UV ray, rays mm -hmm. of the otherwise really wonderful sun, <laughs> life couldn't exist as we know it today. So to understand how life is sustained gives you a better appreciation why these changes, like a little teeny bit of carbon dioxide increase is huge because there's not much up there to start with. I see. So there's just just under, just understanding that knowledge base. Well, and, right. and, and I would key, add, I'm a key. teacher and a marine biologist that that what she said is actually very simplified, but it's also complex enough that most people who say they are for conservation, they are green, would probably limit their actual personal activities to recycling. And some of the simpler things to mm -hmm. do because it's very turning straightforward. Off the light when they leave a it's room. very straight. Or turning off the water when you brush yeah. your teeth. When 80% of the water is actually used to grow things out in Western Kansas, mm -hmm. it's not so much about tooth brushing. But that said, and I think that's one of the reasons it's difficult for the general public to get a good handle on the complex environmental issues that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. They are our, our low hanging fruit. The easy things to do have pretty much been done. I mean, we've tried, we were, and we're now at the harder stuff. It costs more to implement regulatory controls, mm -hmm. and it is expensive, but the benefits can be very high mm -hmm. as well. Uh, speaking of that <coughs> um, a carbon uh, footprint, uh, Kansas- <laughs> Is that a good segue? Kansas <laughs> um, uh, certainly uh, is proposing to increase its carbon footprint with a coal-fired po coal power plant in, uh, Western Kansas, that was very controversial uh, through most of the last decade. Uh, will there be any, you know, the winds, uh, the winds normally will blow uh, west to east. The, uh, uh, the weather systems pretty much blow west to east. Uh, are we going to be impacted at all by the emissions from the plant, uh, if, if it ever gets built, then that's a, that's a whole other question. Uh, the state has given it's okay, but uh, I understand it has run into some licensing problems uh, uh, beyond the state level. Well, the potential uh, is there. Well, what, what is, the, the, what is there. the, is there any downsides to that plant or in terms of, of what we're gonna be breathing here in, in Johnson County? Well, you gotta remember that coal or Eastern Kansas. we're surrounded by coal-fired power plants. I was going to say, so, uh, the, the one, uh, you got one in Lawrence, next to Lawrence, I understand, I've been told, yeah. is one of the dirtiest in the nation. So. We got Lacine, Lacine, and Lacine has undergone major, major renovation uh, to reduce its uh, pollution emissions there. And even though the, the, the modeling, the, the research needed to do all the calculations on the impact, there is a general belief that because of the major overhaul they did of that plant, that we're actually seeing fewer ozone alert days in Kansas mm -hmm. City because of that. Now again, the science isn't in yet, but that's, that's a, f people are feeling pretty strongly about it, uh, that it does have an impact. Um, so we, we are surrounded by coal-fired power plants. Will that one add two? Yeah, sure, we'll add two. How much? Um, I don't know that. It's hard to know. Yeah. Well, the modeling's out there. I mean, air, air quality is, is very based on computer modeling because the, the atmosphere is kind of almost seems infinite. Mm -hmm. and all the nuances of how stuff is transported through the atmosphere and how you do all the calculations. Um, but that would certainly have to be done. I kind of see a different, just a different take on that. <clears throat> um, you know, it's not going to benefit, well, what I understand, it has limited benefits electricity-wise to the state of Kansas. And, and to increase that benefit, we'd have to run transmission lines, which aren't there now. So you're impacting western Kansas to eastern, you know, wherever the centers of electricity are necessary. I understand it's going to, to Colorado, which is fine. Colorado needs it. But I think it really says we don't have a national energy policy. You know, no, we Governor don't Sebelius is uh, under her administration. They said no to, I think, because of an air quality issue that, yeah, that, the, that the federal government hadn't even kind of stepped. They were going to talk about it, but they hadn't done it. So it was a bold step. 
Um, I, whether you agree or disagree, I'm not saying that, but we don't have a national policy that says a lot of those things. We're going to have to have coal energy. We're going to have to have nuclear energy. I don't know that anybody's got an idea how we're going to not keep, uh, continue to, to have more products in our homes that require energy. Plug it and, in your cell phone at it, night. You didn't do that 20 years ago, yeah. and it pulls a power. <laughs> and and right? I don't know that yeah. the science is there yet that we can uh, produce uh, all of our, our electricity from renewable sources. You know, I, before we go unless there, and I a, will go Unless there. you put a windmill in uh, every square mile. There and are some then, ways to look yeah. at distributive power generation on our homes with solar and, and wind, but I would, before we leave Sunflower, um, the question you asked Betsy, the question you asked Betsy was about local air quality issues, whether ozone would be impacted here. Question I ask in reviewing the environmental assessment done by KDHE. The modeling did not indicate at that time that that was going to be the problem. The problem is not about ozone here. The problem is about the amount of carbon dioxide, which will be generated by that plant, contributing to the global warming issue that Betsy tried to explain. We have other ways to make power more efficiently mm -hmm. and much more cleanly than using coal that we mine in Wyoming, transport by rail car to Kansas, <laughs> burn in West Kansas, and sell the power as a merchant plant to other states. Why should we risk that? And there is a mercury problem, mercury that goes up as vapor in the atmosphere, rains back down into our watersheds, it's methylated. I could ask for a a presentation on methylation of mercury by microbes. It enters the food chain, becomes a problem with fishing advisories. So there are several reasons not to burn coal, and it, it isn't so much the ozone or even selling it somewhere else. I mean, business does sell products sure. made here to other companies, but the CO2 output from that plant is the primary reason mm -hmm. we should not be burning coal. Well, there, uh, that plant is uh, quite uh, away mm -hmm. from Johnson County. But I'd like to drill down a little bit uh, to some uh, more pertinent Johnson County type issues. Good. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, pollution uh, at the Sunflower, uh, former former Sunflower Army and Ammunition Plant. Is it, they've re, have they renamed it? Is that something different now? Or no. We just call it Sunflower? It, or it, it, what, it's, What's the name of it now? I don't think there is another name. It, well, well, it's I'm the former it the Sunflower, former Sunflower, Sunflower Army, Army no, Ammunition Plant. That, that works. Which got started, I think, in World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, and uh, produced for quite a long time something called nitroguanidine, right. which was used as an artillery propellant Yes. For artillery shells. Um, and uh, back in World War II, especially, uh, they don't, weren't, there was no EPA. And, uh, you know, if you had some pretty strong pollutants, uh, you just dumped it. Yep. And that's kind of what happened out there. So I want to talk a little bit about what's happening out there. The Army has uh, walked away from the plant, uh, they don't own it anymore. They've turned it over to Johnson County. No. To a developer. Or to a private, developer, I'm sorry. It was <laughs> no. By yeah. way of Johnson County? Yeah. No. No. Johnson County had but, to approve it. And right. yeah. But Johnson County does control the zoning. Correct. Yeah, that, that did happen afterwards. Uh, yeah. and, uh, but the Army doesn't own it anymore. So I want to talk a little bit that. I want to talk also a little bit about your thoughts on, uh, I know that there has been some environmental concerns, and I'm sure Elaine will be glad to address <laughs> this, on the uh, BNSNF uh, railways, a uh, huge, very huge, very large uh, intermodal freight facility uh, near Edgerton that uh, might have been in Gardner, but Gardner didn't want it. So <laughs> Edgerton said they'd take it. But it'll be right outside of it. It'll be in the same it'll spot. Be it'll be in the same, same spot. <laughs> it'll be in the same place. Exactly. It'll be in the same place. Right. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that. And, and I also want to hit a little bit on uh, new regulations that will affect uh, everyone in the county uh, in terms of uh, uh, trash collection and recycling and uh, some uh, very bold initiatives have been undertaken by the county on that. Uh, something called pay as you throw. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that. But, uh, let's first, uh, uh, Mayor, I want to talk to you a little bit about Sunflower. Sunflower is uh, right next to DeSoto. It's right in DeSoto's backyard. That's right. And so how big is the environmental challenge there? Uh, let's start with that first. 
you know, how much I got to be get cleaned up? Yeah, there's uh, of um, this of this stuff that uh, was spread on the site by the army over the years. Uh, yeah, the uh, it's nine thousand, a little over nine thousand acres, uh, transferred in I think two thousand and five to a private developer uh, here in Kansas City, and they've joint ventured with a firm out of Denver that uh, that does this kind of massive work, and. Um, uh, they're responsible for cleaning it up. My understanding is that the Army, uh, however, is not there. They've got out of the title, but they are responsible for asbestos and uh, the cleanup of the nitroguanidine, and I think maybe lead, but um, they're, they're paying for that, that effort. Uh, recently, we found out they, they think they're done with, or the Army thinks they're done with spending the money. I don't know what that'll lead to. So they've cleaned it all up then? Well, <coughs> no, maybe they just spent the yeah. It's not finished it's yet? not no. finished. No. <laughs> KDHE well, is, is, are we going to put the, the local taxpayers on the hook for the cleanup? Uh, I don't seems think... Seems like if the Army made the mess, the Army ought to clean it up. Well, no, it's the, still, you're it's still, a local the taxpayer there. Okay. We're, we're, yeah. we're all citizens and taxpayers of the federal government, so yes, you're your tax dollars would clean it up, I guess you could say it in that way. Well, I'd like to have some folks in New York and California helping me pay for that. Uh, rather than just, uh, <laughs> if the federal uh, the government is, a right. local taxpayer, yeah. but... Uh, it's, still, uh, it's still federal responsibility. still federal responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, right. and, uh, it's still their waste. The, uh, uh, the methods of cleanup that I understand, the nitroguanidine is a, is a highly charged uh, explosive, so you just burn it. That's the accepted right. method. But isn't uh, it in the ground? I mean, don't they have to scrape away some of the ground? There, that, there is that, that and is lead, lead that's in the in the ground. Um, uh, there was groundwater testing done. Uh, no groundwater contamination was found um, of a, a significant value, and um, you know they raised cattle there, so they were eating the grass, and and the things were normal. But um, it's the huge volume. It's nine thousand acres. Uh, which has been quoted as I don't know if Leewood likes this, but that's the size of Leewood. <laughs> but that you know that gives you some magnitude, order of magnitude, how big it is, and uh, it's good that it got transferred. I would say that in but, 2005. Right. It's good that the, that the Johnson County as a whole, uh, we have a hold on it, and uh, and not an army or a federal level that that a lot of things could have happened. But now we have a super challenge in the size and magnitude, and then of course the development that would follow. Well, I was going to say uh, this is this has been given to a private developer. Right. So how much development have we, do we have? Zero. And why? Well, it's not. Why, clean. why aren't we building subdivisions well, like crazy? Is it, the, is the it just the economy? No. Uh, the, yeah, the cleanup isn't projected. The cleanup isn't done. When, when are we supposed to get it all cleaned up? Well, it's a long time process. So now, even development out that far is, is still down the road quite a ways. It was never intended to be. You can't clean it up in a couple of years. That's for sure. Um, but and the you just because you don't have because you don't have land. infrastructure. The developer, if, if I recall, didn't have to pay for the land. He's got it free. Right. Yeah, he's invested a lot of money. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the the uh, you say that facetiously. No, no, oh, I know. No, I know. no, in fact, the developer <laughs> no. sounds, sounds no. awfully economical to me it to is. start developing the place. Now, the well, developer has yeah. said in order to complete the cleanup process, so development could take place, would cost them more than the land would be worth. And that's why we've stopped. It is an economic issue mm -hmm. without more help from the Army mm -hmm. to complete that cleanup. And they are hoping that could be accomplished within the next year or so to get back on track is the way I serve on that remediation oh, okay. advisory board. board. Mm -hmm. So. We are hopeful, but there is no guarantee. Now, 2,000, approximately 2,000 of the 9,000 acres was actually deeded by, by an act of Congress to Johnson County Park and Recreation but, District. But, but I Rick think, part uh, of that uh, Elaine, don't, we'll have it. don't yeah. the developers have to clean up certain parts of that before that The deal takes made place? was that the, the district would not basically take, take ownership it. until the remediation efforts were clean. Most right. of that land is uncontaminated, but it is frustrating for those of us who need and want more open space. Right. That some very beautiful land along the creeks there that surround that property, it's really a buffer zone, would be beautiful for the public to have access to. And I don't to. think, I think that the developer can't release pieces of it right. until the circle of covenants are put mm -hmm. together, and that's through KDHE, a very complicated process. Mm -hmm. And so they have. Department of Health and Environment. Right. Correct. Yeah, they, they are the EPA uh, for, uh, for looking Kansas. at this, looking yeah. at this project. And so you can't just say, well, I cleaned this up, now I'll sell that. Right. That's not, right. not. That can't happen. And the, How much potential is there for economic development out there if you can get it cleaned up? 
I mean, well, is DeSoto, okay. is, is DeSoto <laughs> looking at this as a big bonanza? Ooh. No. <laughs> no. Frankly, it's too long down the, the, the line, but I have a fundamental uh, problem I always have with the community in a park. It, it, it never made much sense. I mean, you could extrapolate that uh, all the r development's coming this way and it's going to be here before you know it, but there's so much vacant ground in between us and them, meaning mm -hmm. Lenexa or Over Olathe or Overland Park, uh, to the east, that this being coming an island of community in a park was really kind of far-fetched, I think. But isn't K-10 like the technology corridor or something like that? Yeah, why don't, why, why don't we go and uh, replicate the Research Triangle in North Carolina, which had office buildings and parking lots and industrial, mm -hmm. which, it, which would have had a lo lesser level of cleanup, cost right. everybody, including the federal government, us, less money to clean this up and start work sooner. The master plan actually has housing development out right. there. Yes. And, Which and, required you know, residential standard cleanup. Right. And, you know, do I want a house, you know, do I want to buy a house on land that was cleaned up and, you know, because it could explode. <laughs> <laughs> well, it... <laughs> No, no, it could, but it's <laughs> we can like lo we're going to lose the kids in this whole <laughs> set. The cleanup has been very extensive. I've been yeah. on the property several yeah. times, right. and and the foundations have been removed, the old sewers have been removed, all the soils in the area have been removed. The real issue, and I'll, I'll just be brief, is that chlordane was applied around the wooden buildings to treat termites, and there was either a misunderstanding or just not good <laughs> communication between the army and the company doing the remediation that whether that should be cleaned up. And mm -hmm. so that is costing more money and making a lot more soil removal mm -hmm. necessary. That's it, it sounds like you might be paying for cleaning up that, uh, that part of, of, the, of the plant. Me? <laughs> <laughs> they I turn it into a 9,000 acre wildlife refuge. I'm for it. <laughs> With wind generators or yeah. something, uh, we can supply power to DeSoto perhaps. Uh, you only need wind. one or two. About wind. One or two of those Wipe for out us. those herons. <laughs> well, the other, the other pretty controversial uh, area uh, and and a certainly a concern for environmentalists has been the intermodal facility out near uh, between uh, Gardner and Edgerton uh, on uh, fairly close to I-35, if I recall, um, mm -hmm. and uh, a, a huge project that I remember a presentation once by the developer, the Allen Group. Uh, the uh, presentation estimated that over a 10-year once they get it built, that over a 10-year period, the intermodal will generate 13,000 jobs. Uh, there has already been uh, warehousing, uh, the Coleman uh, warehouse, for example, gigantic warehouse in Gardner. Right. Uh, Olathe yeah. maintains that several large companies have moved to Olathe in anticipation of, the fr of a freight intermodal. But, but there is concern uh, by environmentalists who have, who have filed uh, legal action uh, against the project that uh, uh, diesel emissions, uh, that, that this is going to add, probably add to this ozone problem, mm -hmm. uh, that we'll be breathing in these diesel exhausts uh, from all these trucks that are gonna be uh, uh, using the uh, intermodal facility there's been concern, uh, certainly I know in Gardner, of the uh, potential uh, truck traffic that will be generated, train traffic that will be generated by this facility. So um, while we have what appears to be a major economic impact, there are people who are worried about the environmental impact. Uh, but I've also talked to folks who say that uh, there's no stopping it at this point. It's too far down the line. Uh, it's got too much support, especially from the state of Kansas, from uh, from Johnson County. Uh, Gardner might not like it, but uh, a lot of other people do. Uh, does the Sierra Club have concerns about the intermodal, Elaine? Well, to be clear first, we're not party to the lawsuit. Okay. That is a local group, H-E-L-P, and a national organization called NRDC has, has joined in on that lawsuit. Air emissions are certainly one of the problems that, that, that or those organizations are concerned about because it will increase truck traffic, particularly coming north on 35 and meeting our, our interchanges in downtown Kansas City. We're going to see more congestion. Congestion means slower, it means more air emissions. I think we're likely to see more air emissions as a result. 
I personally um, consulted with that group on the water issue, which you have not mentioned. Yeah. There's an enormous amount of storm water has to drain off of a facility like that. Not just the intermodal where the cars are loaded and unloaded, yeah, but the warehousing. But the warehousing. It. Yeah. So, you know, acres and acres, close to a thousand acres, are just going to be buried in cement rooftops. And when it rains, we had a five inch rain not too long ago, you know, back in the fall. That is funneled through a stormwater collection system that's being designed by the intermodal facility and then dumped into Bull Creek. There's a little tributary that actually mm -hmm. goes into Milldale Park, one of the parks right. out there. Um, I, I fear more for water quality issues because that's part of the Hillsdale Lake watershed which provides drinking water to about 40 communities. Mm -hmm. The environmental assessment done did not address that. And what the suit really asks for is a complete environmental impact statement which will address all of these issues, the watershed, drinking water mm -hmm. quality, and the EA did not talk about the warehousing as part of the project. They split Just, that off. Okay. So the total numbers are not there for truck traffic, for water. So until they get the complete EIS, that is, that is their suit. Well, but it still brings, you know, the environmental concerns versus the developmental uh, uh, rewards uh, to the, of this project, I think brings into to focus, really, a, a problem that we see even nationally where economic interests are at odds with environmental interests and and how do you balance those concerns how do how do public officials how do count how do local governments balance those concerns uh, uh, you know the you know in this economy we need jobs and the intermodal is offering tremendous job uh, potential uh, you, you got it <coughs> you've you just it's said a it. tough you said issue a, well, you it's said a, a mouthful tough issue. Because uh, I, I belong to the, uh, our, our city is an investor in KC80C, which uh, uh, annually puts on, that's Kansas City Area Development Council. I was going to ask you what that was. And, <laughs> and, and they try to attract business to a 17 county region here. And uh, all I hear uh, from their speakers is that uh, the next wave of job creation really should be the creative mind. Uh, the, the creation. The you know, entrepreneur. How well, how many of us needed an iPad? two years ago you didn't even know what it was so so this whole development and then you're saying 13,000 jobs and I'm not against jobs but those aren't creative jobs those are those are warehousing and and uh, you know crane operation well, and, and uh, so there'll be uh, branch headquarters FedEx for example uh, I think is I'm not saying there. there won't be some of the creative but but the but I see a solution that gets more regional impact instead of being Gardner Edgerton where the plants sit right here and now these two are discussing whether they have it, mm -hmm. it needs to, to be about mm -hmm. Kansas City. Kansas City was built on railroads, practically, right. after the river. And, and so know what our heritage is and know where we're going and then try to make some regional decisions. You're going to have to have freight. You're going to have to have mm -hmm. traffic, but get a little more regional. Mm -hmm. at, at a We've philosophical got about five minutes left. Oh, well, right. we haven't talked trash no, yet. No, we haven't talked no. trash <laughs> yet. <laughs> just let me say, you but, can't, so, you can't so, make so, a dichotomy very of quickly, jobs in the environment. Very quickly. Yeah. That is a false dichotomy. One of the largest and fastest growing sectors in the economy right now is the green jobs that are being generated to, to promote more energy efficiency and the development of new technologies. So let's not base our argument on what is basically a false dichotomy. But okay. let's talk trash. I'm ready. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like trash too. Uh, Betsy. Okay. Uh, bring us up to speed on what the county has, what kind of regulation for 2012, January 1st of 2012, what kind of regulation are we looking at in terms of trash collection and something called pay as you throw? Well, Johnson County, uh, all counties in Kansas are required by state law to have what's called a solid waste management plan. Mm -hmm. And we've been required to have that since the early 70s. Our first one was adopted in 1972. And um, we've always had adequate landfill space. and. Uh, so we could just kind of eat, drink, and be merry about our trash and not worry about being conservation-minded. Or recycling-minded. Recycling-minded, yeah. Um, and with uh, our, the last update of our plan, which was in 2007, basically we identified the, the huge need. This is also directed by the state. The state of Kansas also wants these plans to incorporate waste reduction, waste diversion activities. And so it identified a lot of areas that we should be working on to... Um, it really improves solid waste management in Johnson County to where we're providing the opportunities 
to get more waste diverted from landfills. Landfills should ultimately, at some, at some point in the far distant future, should be at the bottom of mm -hmm. the management scheme of handling our, our waste. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're always going to be producing waste of some kind or the other, but does that waste all go to the landfill? No. But they want more of it. The, the policymakers say we need to recycle more. Yeah, and you have to realize that you know the country. The country hasn't been sitting still. I mean, 20 years ago, 1980, is that 20 years ago? 1980, about 30. 30. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> High mathematics there. <laughs> uh, about 80, 90 percent of what we generate as trash went into a landfill. Nowadays, only it's only about 54 percent of what we generate winds up in the landfill. Recycling has exploded in the United States. It's it's uh, the, it's a huge growth market as far as um, jobs and green mm -hmm. the green job world and all. Yay. Yeah, I mean, it's no question that it's, it's bringing jobs, and it's taking this stuff. I mean, Johns County Landfill, we did a waste sort in 2006 where we actually hired a consultant to go out there and weigh trash mm. coming in. And the number one thing by weight going to the Johns County Landfill is... Diapers. Paper. <laughs> yeah, not diapers. Paper. Oh. paper. Paper and paper, paper. products. Recycled paper, cardboard, paper. newspaper. Even though that's, it's hugely recycled in the United States. You know, like I, what is it, like 80% of news, newsprint's recycled. So anyway, Johnson County, got it, we got aggressive on how are we going to try to implement these recommendations, and we did so through revising our Solid Waste Management Code, which was adopted by the Board of County Commissioners in uh, uh, October 2010. And with this, we did take, the county did take a bold step forward in that we really wanted to get a handle on trash solid waste management and we uh, decided that the best route was through the hauling community so mm -hmm. those that haul residential trash in Johnson County are being regulated for the first mm -hmm. time so if you put out basically the way my understanding was if you as a homeowner put out more than 95 gallons uh, a week uh, of trash that's not recycled you put out more than that you're gonna pay a little more for, well, the, for, for the collection and hauling yeah, it away. What the code basically is requiring is that one is all all residential haulers have to provide curbside recycling to all their single family right. residences, which has not been before. Because John, Johnson County, despite all of its its wonderful things, we're way behind on that national average on recycling. We're only like mm -hmm. 22, 23 percent versus the national average of 34 percent, which is mm -hmm. that's that's kind of sad for Johnson County. You know, mm -hmm. we should be way ahead of that, and so that requires them to provide it. It um, limits, it restricts them from picking up yard waste to be disposed of in a landfill, it has to go right. diverted for composting or mulching. And to incentivize recycling is to set a, a volume-based pricing system. Right. And we set and in the code And that goes into effect January 1st. January 1. The, the, the coming up this year. Yeah. We are uh, out of time. And, and we just uh, now started talking trash? Uh, <laughs> we, we are out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> but stay tuned. We have lots of articles in the Johnson County Sun okay. on Go, Go Green. Go green. All right. Read those articles. Well, we're all going greener these days. And uh, I'm assuming <laughs> that the viewers are also uh, conserving and uh, watching uh, what they throw away and recycling more. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank the panel for being with us and talking trash and talking the environment. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for watching.